central transmission and sensitization, chronic pain, and descending pain modulation. Over the course of this video, we will aim to understand the main ascending pathways and their relative roles, learn the key mechanisms that cause central sensitization, understand the relationship between central sensitization and chronic pain, and learn descending pain modulation mechanisms. Generally speaking, nociceptive fibres, synapse in the dorsal horn at their level of entry, then cross over or desiccate at the same level that the sensory neurons enter. They can then ascend via either the lateral spinothalamic tract or the spinoreticulothalamic tract. The pathway of the lateral spinothalamic tract is outlined here. The lateral spinothalamic tract ascends to the ventral posterior lateral VPL nucleus of the thalamus. Here, the second order neuron synapses with third order neurons. The third order neurons of the lateral spinothalamic tract then project to the somatosensory cortex. This allows conscious awareness and localization of the pain. The spinoreticulothalamic tract is an additional pathway through which nociceptive information can be centrally transmitted. It synapses at a variety of structures and locations, particularly limbic structures associated with emotion and fight or flight responses. There are four key areas it synapses in. The parabrachial nucleus, which then projects to the insular cortex, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and the intralaminar thalamic nucleus. From the intralaminar thalamic nucleus, the information can then be sent to various regions of the cortex. As well as its actions at limbic structures, the spinoreticulothalamic tract also sends out projections which can activate central pain suppression mechanisms. Such regions are at the periaqueductal grey matter, PAG, and in the rostral ventral medulla, or RVM. As well as in the periphery, sensitization can also occur centrally. Repetitive input into the spinal cord can result in central sensitization, particularly repetitive C-fiber input of substance P into the synapse can result in what is called wind-up. Wind-up occurs due to increased electrical activity from the peripheral first order nociceptive neurons, causing further substance P production and release into the synapse between the first order neuron and the second order neuron. This substance P induces plastic changes in the second order neuron, and so it depolarizes more often and more easily. This change is dependent on plasticity. If plasticity is inhibited, this wind-up mechanism will not occur. Which of these is not important for wind-up in central nociceptive neurons? I've been talking a lot about the importance of plasticity in central sensitization. I'm now going to go over the four key central processes that can cause this sensitization. The first is a reduction in the threshold of glutamate receptor activation kinetics. This increases the excitability of the neurons. The receptors such as NMDA or AMPA receptors are involved in this process. A second mechanism is an increase in cell membrane glutamate receptor number. Therefore, glutamate will have a greater effect, thus increasing excitability of the postsynaptic membrane. A third is alterations to axonal ion channels. This would cause an increased inward flow and a decreased outward flow of ions, again making depolarization of the neuron easier further increasing excitability and reducing inhibition. The fourth central sensitization process is a reduction in inhibitory GABA and glycine production. This reduction in inhibition therefore increases the activity of the nociceptive neurons. In this illustration, I'm hoping to help visualize 
these central sensitization processes. As I've said previously, these changes are dependent on neuronal plasticity. There are three overarching themes that result in sensitization. Increased excitability, decreased inhibition, and structural reorganization. As you see here, there's been a sprouting of new fibers of the presynaptic neuron. This further increases the excitability potential, and so you get further pain sensation being transmitted to higher centers. Which of these is not a key process in central sensitization? As I said previously, chronic pain is closely related to this central sensitization. Inadequate pain management can lead to the development of chronic pain, and it is caused by inappropriate central sensitization. You may also get abnormal pain sensation due to malformations in the dorsal horn. For example, sprouting of A-beta fibers directly onto second-order nociceptive neurons. The activation of low-threshold mechanoreceptors causing A-beta fiber stimulation can lead to the activation of second-order nociceptive fibers. This can cause normally innocuous sensations to cause pain. Descending pain pathways can modulate signal transmission in the dorsal horn. A key region involved in this is the periaqueductal gray, or PAG, of the midbrain, which surrounds the central canal between the third and fourth ventricles. There is also some transmission from higher regions within the brain. The periaqueductal gray is the main output center for the limbic system in terms of descending pain modulation and receives inputs from higher brain regions like the hypothalamus, amygdala, and cortex. This suppressive pathway from the periaqueductal gray initially descends to the rostral ventral medulla and then synapses on to a neuron that projects to the same region of the dorsal horn as a synapse between the primary and secondary nociceptive fibers. As you can see in the diagram, these descending pain pathways are also stimulated through the activation of the spinal reticulothalamic tract that we covered earlier, where you can see the projections going to the periaqueductal gray and the rostral ventral medulla. This region, in the blue box, is very important for descending pain modulation and there are a series of key mechanisms at play here. I will now go into this in detail. In descending pain modulation there are three key neurotransmitters serotonin, noradrenaline and enkephalins. Enkephalins are endogenous ligands that activate opioid receptors also known as just endogenous opioids. Activation of the periaqueductal grey matter, for example from higher cortical regions, limbic regions, or through activation of the spinal reticulothalamic tract, induces this descending pain modulation. In the normal nociceptive pathway, the primary nociceptive neuron releases the neurotransmitter such as substance P or glutamate into the synaptic cleft. This neurotransmitter then stimulates an action potential in the second order neuron, causing the central transmission of the nociceptive stimulation and nociceptive sensation. Stimulation from the periaqueductal gray matter can cause the release of serotonin or noradrenaline from a descending neuron, as you see here. The serotonin and noradrenaline have a suppressive effect on the primary presynaptic neuron, thus reducing the release of the excitatory neurotransmitters. The serotonin and noradrenaline also have an excitatory effect on a short local interneuron. This local interneuron releases these endogenous opioids known as enkephalins. Enkephalins have a wide range of effects. They inhibit 
the release of vesicles from the first order neuron. They inhibit the depolarization of the second order neuron in the dorsal horn. So, in all, they reduce the transmission of nociception to the higher regions of the brain, suppressing pain sensation. Which of these options best describes encephalins? So, to recap, you should now be able to understand the main ascending pathways and their relative roles, know the key mechanisms that cause central sensitization, understand the relationships between central sensitization and chronic pain, and understand descending pain modulation mechanisms. Thank you very much for watching and remember to subscribe to Sutton Brain Hub for more videos to help explain the mysteries of the brain.